Hey everyone, welcome to Victory Condition Gaming. My name is Doug. Today we're doing our top 10 RPGs of 2018. Again, for the second year is my good friend Ken Blue from Roll to Play Podcast. What's up, Doug? Also with me is my good friend Alan Barr from Galenite Games. Hey, how's it going? Before we begin our top 10 list, there are two things that I would like you to, to do. One, if you like this type of content and you want to see more of it on the show, hit the like button down below. The second thing is, if you haven't subscribed to our VCG channel, subscribe, and you'll see all sorts of content like this where we feature all sorts of RPGs and board games on our show. Now, let's get to our top 10 lists. All right, now let's get to our top 10 lists. Number 10. All right, my number 10 is not a core rule book. It's the only one on my list that's not a core rule book of a new new game, but it is such a large product and one I've been looking forward to for so many years. Uh, it is the massive Nyarlathotep reprint from Chaosium uh, by Larry Dittilio, Lynn Willis, Mike Mason, Lynn Hardy, Paul Fricker, and Scott Dorward. Uh, it is the, I would say it is uh, Call of Cthulhu's you know, most well-known campaign setting. And I mean, it's, it's over like to, in total, it's over 600 pages. It's just, just packed full. It's got a nice slip case, um, just packed full of information. They updated it. They streamlined it. They made it a little less lethal because, you know, if you're playing a campaign, typically you want to get through it all the way to the end. Uh, and Massive Nar left up is known kind of for its lethality, but yeah, I'm really excited about this. I can't wait to run it. It is one of my things I definitely want to run in 2019 or, well, start because I think it may take a little bit longer than, than you know, half a year to get through it. Uh, my number 10 is actually a game from Gallant Night Games. It's a little selfish. This is actually the, the first time I've ever included my ga my games on a list. Wow. Um, and I put that at number 10 because, you know, I do feel biased. So I, I, at the bottom of the list. But it's our um, classic D20 fantasy game, Eora Thrill. It's uh, it was kind of a personal pet project. Uh, our it's the first game our Patreons helped us fund, so it has a special place in my heart. And I really like uh, the fact that we were able to collect a bunch of old school feeling D twenty mechanics and put them together in this really neat little package. So I'm really proud of the work in there, and uh, the kind of the homage feel to early role playing games. So my number ten is, I think it was Alan's most anticipated game for uh, last for this year that we did that we uh that we shot last year it is flash gordon by pinnacle entertainment group uh it uses the the savage worlds engine uh system it, i i'm gonna admit i have not played this game this was the one game that i did not get in a physical copy and i'm regretting it because i've seen the box set of this game and it is beautiful Alan, did you get a chance to play uh, Flash Gordon at all? I, I haven't. I have the box. I'm looking at it. It's like just barely out of arm's reach. Ugh. Oh, I can grab it if you want to see it. It's so pretty. No, that's just mean. That's it's just just, mean. Oh, I kind of want to just hold it and love it. Yeah. I want to uh, see it. No. I and, see it. Okay. There it is. Oh, it's upside down, Alan. That is a oh, hefty, box. hefty box. Oh, yeah. And it's full of gorgeous custom dice and cards and tokens. And like, this is the two decks of cards, this awesome cliffhanger token. Nice. Oh, super pretty dice. Where are the dice? Dice are gorgeous. Nice Flash Gordon themed poker chips. I'll come running on the show anytime you want. Sweet, sweet. Yeah, I would, uh, I would dig that for sure. But yeah, it's, uh, I haven't had a chance to play it yet. Which is why I didn't make my list. I only put on things I played on my list. Number nine. All right. My number nine is a book that I picked up at Gen Con. Um, it is A Cozy Den. It is by Kira McGran. And it is a book. Um, in case you didn't know, I, I tend to lean more to the sides of uh, like indie games and stuff like that. Uh it's it's not many big game big you know rules heavy games that I enjoy. There are some like Call of Cthulhu that I do enjoy, but when it comes to my my comfort zone, it is smaller indie games. And Cozy Den is definitely one of that. Uh, it is like I said by Kira McGrand. It's a game of an intimate game of domestic winter where you all play uh, lesbian snakes, and and you're you're getting into your den for winter and just kind of 
uh, finding different ways to exist together within this den from napping and wrestling and just different, you know, it's powered by the apocalypse, just kind of making it through the winter with this, with this close knit group of, of, of le well, lesbian snakes, half lesbian, half snakes. This is exactly why I love having the three of us on, on this list because we all have uh, different tastes in, in our role playing games. So I, I love hearing Ken's list because it has so much stuff that, like I've never heard about, like I've never heard of this game. So I, I'm, I'm really like, now I'm going to have to go research it when, when, uh, when, you know, after we have this, this video posted. All right. Number nine for me is the new edition of the Prince Valiant role-playing game from Nocturnal Media. Came out this year. You can get it from Chaosium now. It just got sold this week to Chaosium. They announced. And uh, it's a wonderful game by Greg Stafford who passed away this year. Um, it's a storytelling game where you flip coins for your stats instead of roll dice. So when you do something, you flip coins and the number of heads is the number of successes. And it's a wonderful game about chivalry and knights based on the uh, Hal Foster comic, Prince Valiant, illustrated with beautiful color art all the way through. It's just gorgeous books. If you can get them, I recommend getting them while they're hot. My number nine is higher up on Alan's list. So we will put a thumbtack in that and address it once it's higher on Alan's list. Number eight all right my number eight just snuck in under the wire it actually just went out to backers this week the the uh, pdf copy the sh the book's actually going to print right now but pdf copies were released were released to all the backers and it is kind of a reprint uh repackaging of an old game it's dream askew slash dream apart uh, which is actually it's two different games. It's it's coming out from Buried Without Cer Buried Without Ceremony. It's Avery Alder and Benjamin Rosenbaum. Uh, Avery did Dream Askew. Benjamin did Dream Apart. So it's two games in one book that are kind of they're both games of belonging. They say belonging outside of belonging. So it's two marginalized groups that are living together in kind of a precarious community while you know, kind of bad stuff's happening. So Dream Askew is a group, of, is a is kind of a queer enclave of people during the collapse of society where Dream Apart is. Um, it's a, it explores the story of like a Jewish, um, let's say, Stedel. I've I, I learned how to pronounce it before to make sure I got it right. It's a Jewish Stedel, kind of in a fantastical version of 19th century Eastern Europe. Uh, it's also powered by the apocalypse, which is something you're going to hear me say quite a bit on this mm -hmm. this top 10 so right. it's, it, it is a system i like I, I like how power of the apocalypse powered by the apocalypse works and flows so sure. that one just came in under the wire but i felt because it went out to backers you know the pdf version of the completed game before it goes to printers i felt like i could i could put it in here my number eight is the 30th anniversary reprint of the weston games star wars role-playing game and that is my fantasy number. flight games and that is on my list Okay, well then we will wait till we get to you. All right. My number eight is on my list. Is on your wow. We've got a lot more crossover this year, Alan, than than we have in previous years. So number seven. Well, guess what? Speaking of crossover, I think this is the only game that touches all three of our lists, and my number seven will show up a little bit later on on both Alan and Doug's list. Oh, my number seven is number seven? Capernaum, or Capernaum. I'm saying I'm probably saying that wrong, and I'm super sorry. Um, from Spelljammer Press, uh, distributed by Modifius. Um, it's uh, Arabic style, Arabian night style, uh, Thousand and One Tales of Shahrazad style role playing game, translated from French into English, and uh, it's Mind Jammer Press. It's not Spelljammer Press. It's Mind Jammer. Press. Mind Jammer, yeah. Yep. And uh, it's this wonderful, you play dragon marked uh, individuals in this pseudo Mediterranean area, lots of like uh, European, Arabic, uh, Northern African influences all the way through. Dragon marked who have special powers given to them by dragons who exist outside. You can deal with uh, jinn and kind of the swashbuckling Thousand and One Nights of Arabian Nights Tales game. And it's wonderful and it's beautiful. My number seven is. Outbreak, the Undead, the second edition from Hunter's Book slash I think Renegade is also distributing this now um, or publishing this now. 
Um, this this is only one half of the product line for this uh, for, for Unbreak. The Game Master's Guide is also coming out next next year. Um, but I really liked uh, Outbreak Undead. It is uh, post apocalyptic. It's zombie uh, survival, and whether or not you're going to survive. It is how long are you going to survive? You're going to die at some point in this game. You, you, there's just no no surviving uh, this this world that uh, that exists. It's just how long are you going to be able to hang in there? And uh, really really fun game. The book's beautiful. I can't wait to play it. Uh, I have need to have my friends over. We have uh, big Walking Dead parties every Sunday when when that's uh, airing. And I know that uh, they would really dig this game. And I need to get this to the table. Number six. All right, my number six is one of two games on this list that have swear words in the title. Uh, this is the lesser harsh one. It is Damn the Man, Save the Music, which I think actually came out very, very late of 2017. But yeah, I have to believe it was on my most anticipated of 2018 list. No, I, it, it came out in 2018 because we commented about how it was on your list and we okay. were going to play it when it came out. This okay. Last year. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. I knew it was on my most anticipated, but just looking in the book, it said 2017, December 2017, so I didn't know if it squeaked in like that last week of December after we recorded last year. But Damn the Man Save the Music from Make Big Things, uh, designed by mostly by Hannah Shaper and Evan Rallon. It is... I mean, it is a fantastic game, kind of kind of um, replicating Empire Records. I mean, it, it is a lot of Empire Records. It's trying to save your record store. Uh, I ran it for my show, had a great time running it uh, with a, with my local group. It's a game that that it's kind of I needed more of a table presence for just things I wanted to do with it. So it's so fun. It's kind of it, it plays out in a three act structure. Uh, just just these these um, these kids coming together to save this record store on a big record signing day just great roles actually it won um the it won the best roles award for oh i'm not gonna remember what it is the indie groundbreaker awards i think it was it won best rules so. all right so my number six is also on uh this is the one on doug's list that we were waiting for this yes. is monarchies of mao from onyx press Onyx Path Publishing. Yes, this was uh, this was my number eight. Yes, and uh, I picked this up at PAX Unplugged just two or three weeks ago, and I've already read it, I've already ran it, I've already played it. Wow, you! Yeah. Hmm. I get like four or five games in a week. Uh, this is nice. what happens, Kent, when when you don't, you know, have to edit like an audio. When you just audio. play games for fun. When you just play games for fun and. Whoa! 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 <laughs> <laughs> this is serious research. Oh, okay. I am I am researching how to have fun. Monarchies of Mal made my list. This is the <laughs> sequel to Pugmire in a sense, uh, the companion book where you can play cats of the uh, of the Monarchy of Mao, a uh, uh, cat adventurer. So this is a post, very post apocalyptic, very post post post, um, where cats and dogs have reinvented themselves as adventurers who. Sort of either in the case of dogs, they try to live up to the code of man and be a good dog. It's and, it's kind of like if Planet of the Apes were actually Planet of the Cats and dogs and dogs. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's a companion game, but it's totally standalone, which is great. And uh, beautiful art. It's really fun. It's a great take on the five E mechanics. Eddie Webb did a fantastic job of adapting them and adjusting them to fit his game. It's it's just a wonderful game. My number six is my number eight. Alan's number eight, and it is the Star Wars oh, yeah. edition from West End Games by Fantasy Flight. Uh, while it's not a new game, it is a reprint of an old game, and anybody that knows me knows that I love Star Wars. Like, I love Star Wars. I love D6 dice pool system games. Like, this is so much fun i want to play this on my show like i like this is a priority for 2019 like i want star wars content on my show the rules are the same yeah it's just Which the... early west end games d6 and we, right. can, we can get into this later um was one of the tightest rule sets and it's just so good that even going back at it there's very little that needs to be changed in the actual rules i mean some of the language and communication style could probably be updated but the actual mechanics are solid and they're still solid and i 
I would not be changing them if I was playing this. Number five. All right, my number five is a game that I know was on my most anticipated for 2018 last year, and that is Starcrossed from Bully Pulpit, designed by Alex Roberts. Of did the, that come uh, out? Yes, it did. Um, I know. Well, I, I backed it on Kickstarter. I know I got the PDF, uh, which I only backed to the PDF level. And I think. Oh, okay. I, th- I backed for the whole shebang with the uh, okay. Jenga, the Jenga Tower, and everything. Okay, that may not not have come out yet yet, but yeah yeah, that may not have come out yet i know i've seen like production photos of that but it may not have shipped out yet but yeah this game is i mean like alan said it uses the jenga tower like uh like dread does but it's it's a story of of two people that really really want to but really really shouldn't and it is a game i desperately want to play but the jenga tower you know it is something i have to play face to face with someone to play well to play it the way it was designed i know they're Someone has come up with like a, a way to play it online where it's like through like you roll dice and after so many of the same dice roll, it, the tower collapses or whatever. So someone has made it accessible to play online, but I really want to play with that Jenga tower. I have I have the setting I want to run in mind and I just haven't haven't had a chance to sit down with someone, but I've read through the rules. I've heard it played many times and it's just a fascinating game that that I cannot wait to play. All right, so my number uh, five is also on other people's list at a higher number, so we will wait on that. My number five is a game by Free League Publishing. This was also on my most anticipated uh, RPG list for 2018. It is Mutant Mechatron, and I'm going to tell you right now, that Mutant Year Zero is one of my favorite games of all time to play. I, I love the, the Year Zero engine. I love post-apocalyptic games. I love the way this game just works. Uh, I love the dice pool systems, and I love how like you try to roll for sixes to get successes. If you roll ones, they're, they kind of cancel out the, one, the, the sixes. You can push a roll. It's, it just it hits so many buttons. I love the mechanics of this. With this... Uh, with this particular game, again, it is it is like an expansion of the Mutant Year Zero uh, game, but you play as robots that are sentient, and this is you can play the standalone. You're playing in this underwater like uh, enclave kind of system that's called uh, uh, Mechatron One, and you are. Yeah, I don't want to spoil so much, but yeah, you are a sentient robot and you're trying to hide the fact that you aren't, you have your own free will now. And it's just so good. Like, I love ro- robots in general, um, as you can probably tell. So when they announced that this was coming out, I was all on board with this. This was so, mo- this is so good. So good. So good. If you like, like playing as robots and they they even made the mechanics so that you, you feel like you are a robot but yet you're still you have personality so i think they did a great job at designing this game i was kind of worried that it might not translate well with the rule set but they've they've really modified it to, to play really really well and i was really excited when this arrived and again this is another game that i want to feature on the show um I love mutant. I love uh, mutant year zero. I think it's just a phenomenal setting. Number number four. My number four is my second of games with swear words in the title. Uh, this one is F word. It's Dracula. So it's taken a lot of restraint to not just say it, but you know, just say it. Just say it. <laughs> Thank you for keeping my show family friendly. It's family friendly. It's Dracula by oh. Levon Jahanian. Uh, it was actually a finalist in the 200 word RPG uh, contest this year. Wow. So this is a 200 word RPG. But I mean, it's so it, you know, it, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's out there. You can find it real easy just by either Googling it or go to the 200 word RPG contest page. Um, you are your villagers on a desert planet, uh, and suddenly, you know, it's 3000 AD, uh, and suddenly this coffin shaped box crash lands to the south of you. Uh, and it just kind of plays out from there. And at some point, oh, 
F, it's Dracula is going to show up. Uh, it, uh, it's have you have, have you run this on your channel? <laughs> I, I I'm going to because when I'm you gonna, do, it, I, it, it, I I require that you invite me. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. This yeah. sounds exactly like the kind of game I want to play. <laughs> it's such, I mean, you know, it's such a small rule set, just 200 words. You know, this is a, an annual competition that goes on to write write RPGs using just 200 words, and then they, you know, they pick some finalists and a winner. And this was one of the finalists, which. Uh, Levon Jahanian is actually going to tie into my number three, but we'll get there in just a moment. My number four is also Doug's number nine. It is. That's right. And that's the Warhammer Fantasy role playing game, fifth edition, fourth edition, fourth edition, fourth edition, Cubicle Seven. And this just hit street date this week. We managed to score some copies at PAX Unplugged. We did. They they sold out Saturday morning of PAX Unplugged. Like and it's awesome. I have not. I've I've just started reading this, but just starting reading it just really has me excited to play this. Like I'm, as you can probably tell, I'm not a big fantasy person. Like I, I the fantasy genre isn't really my go to, but I I'm digging this so far. Yeah, it's so great. It's it's a wonderful game because it's so much an homage to the first and second editions of the game, but it's also updated to a very modern sense and. Nobody does kind of bizarrely weird, grim, dark, gunpowder fantasy quite like Warhammer Fantasy or this rule set. And Cubicle 7 just knocked it out of the park. All right. So my number four is probably my most su surprising entry on my list. And I know it's not on any of uh, either Kent's or Alan's lists. And it's a game that I think it, it needs it needs more love the, out of all the games that came out in 2018. And that is sins the role-playing game now this is a very cool post-apocalyptic game now there's there's a couple drawbacks to this game i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna tell you why why this isn't higher on my list um first of all the game is, the book is is huge it's it's you know it's like 360 pages and and the art is awesome and it's it's just it's a beautiful setting it's it's just a it's just a wonderful post-apocalyptic setting it's got like this mix of like walking dead and aliens and like venom like it's like all these different genres like rolled into this rpg it's it uses a d6 dice pool system again uh, it hits all the buttons the only downside that i have with this game the only downside is that the setting requires a lot of research and a, like a lot there's a lot of like pre like learning before you play in the setting because there's a lot of alien like things that have happened in this world that you're supposed to be playing in that the players kind of should know while they're playing so if you can't it's not really one of those games that you can just kind of pick up and play and, and just you know run for folks they've got to kind of have a little bit of background information on the on the setting so it would probably be a little bit higher if not for that. But if you have folks that really like like post-apocalyptic and like sci-fi and just kind of really dark like settings, this is a really, really cool RPG. And I I dig it a lot. Um it's by first I, I don't know if I mentioned, but it's by first falling leaf limited. They're out of the UK. Um, but yeah, uh Sam Sleeney is, uh, I think, the major force behind this book, and it needs more love, folks. Give, go check it out because I, I really dig Sins the the RPG. So, that is my number four. Number three. All right, we're going to do a little lead up to number three here uh, before actually talking about the game. So this year, while while home one day sick or something or with a sick kid, I stumbled across a small animated series on Hulu called Over the Garden Wall. Never heard anything about it. It's a few years old. Uh, just 10 episodes. It was on Cartoon Network. Just 10 episodes. Um, Elijah Wood, I think, did a voice in it. Watched it all in one sitting. Just completely wrapped up. And it's about two brothers that uh, go over a garden wall and end up kind of in this different land, you know. And that's kind of it's got it's kind of creepy at times, you know. There's times where my five year old got kind of creeped out by it. It's you know, so it's it's kind of a little bit creepy. 
but this 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 show is all I thought about for a long time. And then it just so happened the same week on Twitter. I don't know that if this is an official game or if somebody just wrote it up, but Erica Chapel posted on Twitter this this game, uh, a Dropbox or a Google Drive link to this game called The Way Home. And she had wrote a game that it kind of mimics mimics over the wall. Uh, it's about kids that are lost, uh, that are they're lit. You play lost children in this kind of strange land and all, all the antagonists have are kind of like have different layers. You kind of have to work to get to the center of these, of the antagonists in this game to kind of figure out what they're all about to kind of overcome them. It's powered by the apocalypse, uh, but it's twisted to where it's actually roll low where powered by the apocalypse. Typically you want to roll, you know, 10 or higher or seven to nine for a partial success. This you want to roll low. But just reading through the rules of it, and again, I don't know that it's an official release. She just shared this out on Twitter. Uh, I, I I got it on my drive and read it and just, it really, it captures the feel of that show over the garden wall. So I hope this, I hope this does get some sort of release. Uh, she has not talked about it since. So I think maybe this is it. So that's why I put it on this list because it came out. It was, you know, she wrote it this year and it came out this year. So that's why I put it on the list. But it captures that feeling of that show so so well of just being lost in this kind of strange world uh and it just it had such an impact on me just reading it after watching this show that it landed really high i mean it's one of the first games i thought of when i thought of this list so all right so my number three is uh from scratch pad publishing and it's dusk city outlaws the fantasy heist role-playing game in a box so it's really cool because it's this pick up and play RPG that takes a lot of its influence from board games. So there's very little prep. All the missions are sort of in the back of this book. Uh, when you make a character, you pick a couple cards. It tells you everything you need to know. You're done. It's a really intuitive, simple system. But there's a lot of interesting mechanics that get the heist feeling genre so right. Like seeing this as a board game would not shock me, but it fits so well as an RPG that it's just. It just blew my mind when we played it the other day. Yeah, I just picked that up uh, just a couple of days ago on a bundle of holding. Uh, yeah. And uh, it looked, uh, looked pretty interesting. I have not uh, got a chance to dig into it yet. Well, my number three is this little game that came out this year from this company called Gallant Night Games. Those guys are the worst. The, uh, the designer is, uh, you know, a good close personal friend of mine. You know, but that doesn't mean that that's why this is the game is on my top 10 list. But the game is Tiny Dungeon 2nd Edition from Gallant Knight Games by Alan Barr. Um, okay, so here's the thing. I, I would say this, even if even if Alan weren't on my show, I would say this, even if, even if we weren't friends, I really love this game. And I'm speaking from the parent part of my life. Like, I... I really think that what Alan has here is something that was really needed in the RPG industry. It is this great, just really easy RP fantasy RPG that you can sit down and you can just play with your kids or you can play with these folks with folks that aren't familiar with RPGs. It is such a great, like, introductory game to get folks interested in rpgs like and the book is is well done it's it's got great illustrations in it i i can't say like anybody that is thinking about introducing their kids or friends to rpgs pick up a copy of tiny dungeon because Everything you need is this this bo this book right here. Now this is the hardcover copy. Like you can pick up the the soft cover copy for what is it, like twenty five bucks or something. And if if it, it, it's currently part of the drive through sale for teacher kids games. Nice, nice. So if you want to score a pretty cheap PDF or a discounted book, now's the time. <clears throat> I know that there's a hatchling edition of this game. I that's the one that's on sale. Okay, well. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say this right. Right. I don't know why there's a hatchling edition of this game because this game right here is perfect just for kids as it is. Like, I can answer that. Okay, a answer the answer that question. The hatchling was, edition was rewritten by parents and kids to be accessible to kids upon reading. 
Okay, so if like kids, if younger kids wanted to read it, and then, and then mechanically, it's all the same. Okay, but okay. there's some new rules. Like there's a there's a hatchling heritage you can play as in the hatchling edition. Okay, well, but then, what it was is it was written and replay tested and rewritten and replay tested, so kids could pick it up, they could read it, and they could just run a game out of this book. Nice, nice. Okay, well then that makes a little more sense. I think that this was a great. I think that this product right here was was so needed. I know that there's other I know that there's other RPGs on the market that you know try to introduce kids to role playing. I think that this this book right there does it so phenomenally, and it's no wonder that it's been such a huge hit for Alan. That if you want to, if you play Dungeons and Dragons or fifth you know fifth fifth edition or whatever, and you have kids that you want to kind of bring them into role playing rather than put the the fifth edition book in front of them put tiny dungeon in front of them and see if they they gravitate towards it if they do then you bring them into other other games i I just think it's such a great introductory like a great game for folks that can just it can just build the industry even even further number number two my number two, actually, Doug is going to talk about as his number one. So I will chime in at that point. So I guess that's me. My number two is Cavaliers of Mars from Onyx Path Publishing. This is, uh, I'm a big fan of the planetary romance genre, the John Carter swashbuckling pseudo sci-fi stuff. And Rose Bailey's Cavaliers of Mars is this perfect blend of modern update and classic feel to it. It's got great narrative story mechanics. Um, it's got great action mechanics. It, it's just all around. It nails. She, it's clear that Rose understands the planetary romance genre because this game is just dripping with rules that make it live that genre. It's so good. I cannot recommend this game enough. Well, my number two was my most anticipated RPG for 2018. I just got in the other day, just released at retail. Also, it- my number seven. And my number five. It is on all of our lists, so evidently, you should go check it out. It is this great box set from Free League Publishing called Forbidden Lands. This is like a retro fantasy RPG. I'm I'm just gonna open the box just just while we're on camera because folks need to need to see what what uh, this box set entails. Just because I love this, it's got two faux leather faux leather uh, books. Are those the standard edition books, or did you get like a collector's edition? No, these are the standard. This is what comes in the box set. Wow. Well, good because I only got the PDFs on the Kickstarter, so I went and bought the box. So yeah, that's what I'm getting. That's a win. This you got the player's handbook. You've got your game master's guide. Okay, so you've got these, and they're they're good sized books. They're not, you know, they're, and they, they got the nice gold foil on them. You've got this legends and adventurer booklet, which you can just this is just like an immediate like if you want to sit down and start playing with with players this is what you reference right here you just roll and it gives you random players to play like it is just an awesome like almost like a quick start um guy just to kind of get folks playing now the best part about this game that i love uh and this game uses the uh mutant year zero engine or the year zero engine uh for for its system uh so it's d6 dice pool uh with you know it's been it's been changed though to include other polyhedrals right yeah instead of using just just d6s uh you can find relics in this game and the relics are a lot more powerful so you can find you know maybe you find something that uh inflects more damage and you get to roll a d8 or a d10 or a d12 and uh instead of just one point of damage like the sixes do on the d6s you can actually do more damage if you roll high on those other dice which is really really cool i'm so excited they added more types of dice in this in this system the other thing that i really dig about this game is that it takes place and it comes with this hex map with stickers like, so at the end of your campaign, you're going to have, like, this legacy map that's going to be unique to you, to your game. No one is going to have a game, uh, have a map that's like that. And Whatever. The minute I get a picture of Doug's, I'm just going to duplicate his map. <laughs> whatever, 
the cool thing is you're going to be able to like look at that map and you'll be like, oh yeah, remember that epic death right there that happened? Or remember that, uh, you know, th that monster that we, that we had to fight to take over that stronghold from that section, you know, from that part of the map. Like, I love that. I love having something like, like a keepsake from your campaign that you get to look at, like as, as a reminder, like, every so often i think that's a really cool thing about this game and then i of course you're going to be able to buy like more maps and more sticker packs for for this game but just the just the quality of this game is is so so high and and i it didn't disappoint it, it was a tough call between this one and, and my number one all right our number ones so doug i'd like to propose a change to the order since right. my number two, I'll go first. Since my two, my number two is your number one. I'd like to talk about my number one as my number one because if I talk about my number one now, then I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna end off by talking about my number two when you talk about your number one. All right. Does that make sense? That that, that that's fine. I've had some whiskey. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think we're all in the same boat except Doug at this point. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. I'll get mine out of the way because you two are gonna be bouncing off each other. So my number one is a PDF that came out in 2017, but the Kickstarter fulfilled to backers fully in 2018. So that's when I got it. That's when I'm including it. It is the English translation of the French RPG Worm by Nocturnal Media. This is a uh, caveman style role playing game where you play cavemen in a tribe just trying to survive in the prehistoric, uh, well, not quite prehistoric, right? But the, uh, the Neolithic era of uh, trying to, it, and it's this wonderful collection of simple mechanics and interesting rules and just dripping with flavor the guy who wrote it did all the art for it it's just this beautiful uh neolithic role-playing game about tribe and family and community and it's just so wonderful to play wow that sounds i mean that sounds like something i would enjoy so yeah it's a, it's a very traditional in the sense of rule right it's a d6 had them together try to beat the target number kind of game um, but it's very simple mechanics. It's 2d6, you know, unless you have a gift that gives you a bonus d6. And uh, it's about like hunting and trying to survive and get enough food. And there's all these really interesting rules about the type of weather and making a, you have to, like fire starting is a skill that you have to have because if you don't have it, you'll die when you go hunting. Yeah. You'll yeah. get caught in weather on the way home and not make it back. Yeah. So it's, just, it's just, and it's all about feeding the tribe. You have to bring back enough food that the rest of the tribe can survive. And it's just wonderful. I'll let Doug do most of the talking because it's his number one. So no, no, we can we can go back and forth. It's fine. Yeah, my number two was Kids on Bikes uh, from Hunters Entertainment and Renegade Games by John Gilmore and Doug Lewandowski. Um, Kids on Bikes is just a great game that I think really captures the spirit of it. Uh, I will pass it over to you, Doug, for a bit, and we'll just bounce off each other. Okay. Here. Okay. So. What Kent has right there is the deluxe version. What I have in my hands, I also have a deluxe version, but I also have the the regular version, which is this this booklet right here. I there, there's a few reasons why I love kids kids on bikes. Most if you saw my top ten list from last year, you know that, or my top five list, I think we did last year. Um, you know that Tales from the Loop was was my number one. That eighties genre really resonates with me because you know i was an 80s kid so i love that setting in general i love this game for a few reasons not only just because of the setting because i, I don't think I, if if we're going to be talking about the rules for this and, and the mechanics for this game i don't know if the the rules and the mechanics tie to the setting as well as some some other games I, because you can play, you can kind of play this even like we play dads on mowers. So like you can take this rule set and kind of put it in any kind of setting you kind of want to play it in. Um, they just happen to call it kids on bikes. And that's, you know, and, and that's the main part of the, uh, the setting that they have in the book. So I, I don't know that the, the, the rule set and the mechanics like, tie to the setting as as good as as some or as well as some, some other games but i love this game because it's easy to pick up and play the game book is was this 75 pages long okay you can pick this game up and this again everything that i love about tiny dungeon kind of applies for kids on bikes you can pick this up and you can just play it with with your friends without even you know, 
teaching them anything about RPGs. It's just really, really simple. It, it uses all the polyhedral dice. I love the collaborative world building that you do, like when you start the, the session, like that, like just, I love it. I love it. I love it. I played this game more than any other RPG this year. And I wrote an adventure for it that I that I played at uh, Free RPG Day. I, I was invited to a store to run this game. Like who who calls some like who like I can't thank Tony enough for calling me up and saying, "Hey, Doug, I know you love this game. Would you mind coming to my store and playing this for my for my for my customers?" Because I think they would have a blast with it. Like who? Like that? That was a huge honor for me. Like I can't, I can't thank Tony enough for that. Like, and and I think that that was. I, I think they all had a great time playing it. This game has put a lot of real awesome people in my life, and that's what you want with an RPG. You want to make connections with folks, and when a game like Kids on Bikes. You know, when, when you can play, sit down, have a great experience, but then also make connections because of that experience, like on like a personal level, like that's something special. And and that's why I, Kids on Bikes, my, my number one uh, RPG of the, of the year, uh, just because I got to experience and meet and it's, I won't say it's like life-changing, but it has brought a lot more folks into my life that weren't there in 2017. All right. So that's hard to follow. Uh, but any other year, this would be my number one. So let me just say a few things about kids on bikes. Um, the, the world building, the collaborative world building and question segment in the beginning is probably one of my favorite things about this game because you can sit down as a GM, you can sit down with this game with nothing in your mind, but the kind of world building collaborative process of creating your characters, creating this small town you're in can give you so much that that a GM it can just run with anything any of the players have said from it. So I think that's a really it's cool in the way in the way it's wrote, uh, but but the way that it's applied to the session itself is even more cooler to me. So uh, the shared powered character, I think is really cool. How oh, everybody, yeah. yeah, how everybody at the table shares this, this central figure, uh, this, I mean, if you want to tie it to Stranger Things, this 11 figure uh, that everybody has a different aspect that they control of this character. And I think that that's pretty thematic because this, this central strange powered character helps everybody in these shows you know they're there as this piece that's there to help everybody so in the game everybody has a piece of this character that they control and i think that's just really cool so but yeah um i just i think that it does a lot of things great i think in the deluxe edition there are a lot of good um adventure modules i will i mean i have to speak to dads on mowers which is the single thing that wrapped me into this game <laughs> seeing it on kickstarter and seeing dads on mowers uh pulled me into this game so fast because that is just the right amount of strange that right, right. that grabs me so it, it's a fantastic module uh I, I, ran, ran it on my show so again banana chin yeah another person that is a, that, that i consider a friend because of this game yeah yeah so like i said any other year i think kids on bikes would take number one but my number one, if you pay attention to me at all on the internet, this should be no surprise because Spire by Grant Howitt and Chris Taylor is my absolute number one game. I've spent more time in this book than any other book this year just reading it. This book, the rules are really cool. Um, I mean, just this, you you play as Drow. Up in, in kind of a resistance against the high elves in this mile high city is what the game is. What I love most about this book is it's it is so well written. It is so fully realized, but yet vague enough that you can create your own stories in it. 
uh, one, I mean, this, the, a phrase in this book that's repeated a bunch is you get a list of things. People think, okay, there's a list of why Spire is here. You know, it's, it's part of a God. It's this, you know, just this big city that someone left behind. And at the very end of it says, but none of that's true. So you have all these things that people in this world think this city is, but there's no definite answer. Uh, and from talking to Grant, they don't even know the answer. You know, there's so much in this book where they lay out so much, but it is so open for people to take and mess with it as much as they want. And that that's what I love most about this book. It's fully realized yet fully open. Uh, I know they did a Kickstarter to to, the, to to find an expansion to this that kind of touches on more areas of Spire. It's just this wide open world that that I'm just in love with. I've read this book four or five times, you know, and, and I've, I've played Inspire. Um, I've been planning my own campaign of it. It is easily my number one game this year. Would, would you say it inspires you to play this game? No, I would not. I would not. Yes, I would. It inspires me to play this game. <laughs> yeah. Spire from Grant Howitt, Christopher Taylor, my number one. All right. I guess that's going to do it for our top 10 list of 2018 if you like this video please give it a like down below subscribe to the channel go check out roll to play podcast on where can you find them where can folks find roll to play podcast um on okay. thursday specifically if you subscribe to the podcast I, i'm on most podcatchers i probably need to get myself on spotify but you know you can find me out there google roll to play podcast i'm pretty easy to find roll to play podcast.com will take you to my my page on the fan off network which is the network that hosts me so that i don't talk about a whole lot probably should but yeah and go check out gallon night games uh alan where, where can folks find more about gallon night cool. games gallon night games.com you can find us on facebook on twitter on anywhere i mean on anywhere yeah. google gallon night games again we're not hiding ourselves here nice nice and likewise if if you haven't uh if you'd like to know more about what we do here at Victory Condition Gaming, please check us out on Facebook. And uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at Doug VC Gaming. All right, folks, that's going to do it for our top 10 list of 2018 games. Make sure to check out our upcoming video for most anticipated RPGs for 2019. This has been Victory Condition Gaming because winning shouldn't be the only victory condition when you get to the table. We'll see you next time.